I'm starting with this one because it's actually probably the, one of the earlier paintings. It's when I came back from working up in Darwin at the, uh, what's now the university there. Uh, and I decided to move from Perth for a while. I found Darwin quite exciting but far too sweaty for me. Uh, the painting I think was probably just called a, da uh, a Northern Territory painting. I found the Northern Territory quite mind-blowing because of I used to, had a nice big four-wheel drive Land Rover, went off in with my son into the sort of what I called the mangrove swamps and the really sort of outback areas where we probably lucky we got out of them, but we did in the end. Uh, and I, I found it really quite difficult to comprehend this as a landscape. And I turned the whole thing into the predator and the prey. In that the predator is the big white, he's not actually an eagle or any particular bird, he's a, he's a predator. And the prey is definitely the symbol of the Northern Territory. If you look closely, he's not a badly painted barramundi, but he comes across basically as a piece of paint in a very tangled environment. And that's really what I was aiming at. But you get some sort of feeling of the viciousness of the whole, to me, a, an Englishman born in suburban London, or in fact the East End of London, you get a real, a real shock when you're right out in a place where A, you might not get out of because you can't get bogged in some mud and B, you're all alone. So that was a symbol of being, in fact, between the predator, which is in many respects the landscape and the feeling, and me, the fish, being a Pisces young man or old man, as I am now, um, was the one that was being preyed on. I felt the landscape was actually taking over from me. And I did do some quite good drawings of mangroves, which I've never actually done anything with. So that's, I think we'll leave. I am going to continuously move from one thing to another. Oh, no, yeah. this is, uh, well, uh, okay, I can talk about this one, that's fine. That's very similar in a way because we've got the same, uh, this is really more to do with, you know, Everything's to do with what the painting looks like when you finish it. It's nothing to do with what the story is. We don't know why Rembrandt painted his pictures. We don't why, know why Michelangelo did most of his sculptures. There's no stories to them, but we're used to being told stories about paintings that Jackson Pollock, you know, was drunk when he painted and sang songs of the Old South while he was dancing around on a piece of canvas, but he probably didn't. Actually, when he named one, a, a big painting with a name like Lavender Mist, which looks like Lavender Mist, but I'm sure he didn't set out to paint Lavender Mist. It just came while he was actually working on it. And that tends to happen with most paintings. This one has also got the Predator, who's basically more of a, Mm, you might say a, a sort of shadow of impending doom and the rather pretty and submissive, which is a rabbit, but it probably looks more like a hare because he's got long ears. But the two colours, the, the, the absolute black and the menacing little eye on the bird is balanced by the innocence of the form underneath it. Now, do you don't want to say any more than that? Is that enough? No, that's absolutely fine, as much as you want to say. Okay. Well, obviously a youthful figure, possibly my thoughts about being a youthful long-distance runner once in my life, but not anymore. Uh, it was a series of paintings I did about the states that one is in in life, you know, moving through time. Uh, 
The bees and the skulls are just symbols. The bees, I was doing a lot of paintings about bees and I needed to balance the movement of the figure going violently to the left with something to go with him but slow him down a little bit visually. And then if you notice with the skulls at the bottom which is his passing through time, they are there not only as the symbol of a skull but they're all turning slightly away from the movement of the figure in that direction. So it's basically about something going in one direction, another one going in another direction and another one balancing it going in opposite direction. So it's, it's really a visual play of elements inside a painting. All right, this is a, <coughs> excuse me, a painting I like in a peculiar way. It's called The Big Finger of God. You can't miss that. It's written in gold leaf on the back there. Um, God has a completely non-finger finger. As we can't say what God looks like and never will, um, there's not much point in giving him a very recognisable finger. He's got a fingernail. In a way, it's not humorous, but it's got a sort of British uh, oddball poetry, like, you know, the owl and the pussycat kind of look at life and the, the uh, Alice through the Wonderland. So basically, it's a very simple idea. The big finger of God is a, a mass coming in from one side of the picture He's actually mowing down all the poor little people that are running past and as they run past, as in life, he occasionally squashes one out and some of them carry on and they change slightly into a more humanistic bloody colour as they move to the left. So it's just around about the, pro the progression of um, somebody looking back at life and probably looking forward at life. So we'll leave that one as it is. Um, what did I do with this? Yeah, yeah. Here we go, that's now I've got to go. Got to go right. right now. That's it. Yeah. So we're back to him, we've done him. Oh no, we've got to go right. Yeah, I'm going right. No, we've done him, we, there's two of those. Are you going back? Right? No, no, I'm not, I'm going the right way. Oh no, you're not. You sure? Are you going back to the beginning? Right. Right, Just click the right arrow. Right. Okay. Here we go, two on those. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Finger. El Finger. And there we go. And we've, bird, you've, we? you've talked about the bird and I've the fish. About the bird, didn't I? And the next one as well. One. Okay. And we talked about that one. Yeah. yeah and so the one. next one will be the. Stan's got that one. All oh, right. All right. Yes, well, the, uh, this is a typical of a particular period when I was juggling, um, visually juggling, various shapes and motifs mainly to do with natural creatures and natural phenomena and sometimes with a little bit of uh, or perhaps sometimes a bit too much of reference to symbolic qualities so in a way it's uh, fairly self-explanatory it's a gives me a whole area in which I can play around with different colours, different qualities of paint. Um, in this one I think I was fairly interested in overlaying one colour over another one and then using Popsy a stronger colour on top of that and treating different things in different ways. I haven't seen this one for a long time and I've got two little birds in the middle there which are our local birds which are the um, uh, what they're called now. 
but the the two in the middle I hadn't noticed for some time and they were oh, they're really rather nice and I quite like the the tiny little bird on the top and it's again a struggle between the elements in nature of the big dynamic long neck turtle, tur tur turtle which we have quite a lot in the dams around here and a visitor which we had or I had physically under the house which was a tiger snake and they are quite poisonous quite dangerous he was under the house I was quite upset for having this tiger snake under the house if I tried to chase him out he'd probably have gone for me so what I did is I made a I made a couple of uh, cardboard snakes and painted them bright yellow with stripes on and put them where he was going in and out hoping it would disrupt him anyway he disappeared in disgust fairly quickly mm. that is a critical um, comment on how bad the unpainted <laughs> tiger snakes were probably that he was being chased out by another couple of tiger snakes so that's basically where it ended but I quite like that painting it's uh, it does have an owner as well which is good it's nice when people paintings have owners it's when they don't have owners they get a bit um, unhappy Pretty when they're happy really uh, here we go we've got that one right right yeah we'll give that one a miss I think yeah it's uh, no, just another yeah. it's eminent elements um, I think because of there, it's got a, f a bit of a sheen on it, so it's very difficult to mm. get yeah, a good no. comment about yeah. it. But I did quite a few on that, the pedestals standing with little offerings in front of landscapes. That's the same one, I think. Yeah, I was probably trying to get the sheen yeah, off it, but it didn't you know, work. Like, Sheen's well, even I don't worse. know where the pedestals came from. It was, um, you know, one's got a moon on it, one's got a still life. I think that's just looking at time, you know, in a day you may see various objects, putting them up in front of uh, a couple of big dominant creatures. Hmm. Oh, that's, now this is, uh, his eye looks like the moon and he's got a little, nice little blossom tree in the background and he's also got an owner down in Albany somewhere and I really liked the painting it was called the blind bird and although he's not blind he's only blind because the, the, the moon has taken over and that more or less proves that if it doesn't come across as a moonlight painting it definitely is a moonlight painting but it's just various thoughts f filtering through time and f filtering through your head um, turned into a visual object and that's that's that one good mm. here we go again Got him. Uh, that's a very small painting um, probably mainly to do with the use of not hastily applied but densely applied fairly heavy paint um, one layer over another and it really is a very close I did a lot of paintings on blossom trees and big trees that turn different colors which are all around my house at the moment and that one is just a close-up look at the blossom on a tree as simple as that ah, very cute found a home very quickly I'm glad to say um, he's even got two little eyes like two little moons and a nice big moon above him so it's basically a, just a statement about the beauty of things in the evening um, transfer, transposing them into paint and using colour and texture to give a feeling of that particular time of day as the moon has risen fairly strongly sort of not the really. it's a big crescent moon it's not a, not a full moon uh, and the owl is sitting there dominating the whole of his empire during the night time and the evening and I'm very fond of owls as well that 
that's uh, a very small painting. Um, a sort of strange little green man. There's an English painter. Oh, I can't think of his name at the moment. Um, who did a lot of painting called The Yellow Man. And I thought, well, I'll do a yellow moon and a green man just to make it because that's nothing to do with my English heritage. But it's really to do with uh, just figures in the landscape. The moon is almost the sun um, and using paint in a reasonably dexterous and decorative way. Uh, that was a... I did a lot of trip titches. Well, they more or less recognised times of the day. Obviously, the, the symbol for the night time or the evening is the moon, and he's got a moon behind him. To me, the symbol of the daytime is when the birds start making a hell of a racket. And the s symbol for the evening is more to do with the colour and that's occasionally what we see in this area. We see very few owls, but there are some in the park down at the bottom of the town of Bailing Up. Um, and we do see quite a few uh, predatory hawks high up in the sky. But So it's basically a, a movement through the daytime. There were a lot of these little paintings and some big ones. It's a whole series of paintings. There must have been oh, about 20 or more of them and about half a dozen of them quite large. Um, and it was all to do with my, not my favourite painter, but almost my favourite painter, and that was Georges Braque, the French experimental painter who... Picasso rather derisively called my the, the wife that loves me best as though Braque had been copying him but in fact Braque was at that time of Cubism was more original than Picasso and Picasso was really copying Braque so I've always loved Braque because he chugged away on his own he wasn't the sort of um, big star in the internationally but after he, you know, time, people have realised how really good he was. So he's a little cut-out figure, and he has backgrounds, and that would be like Braque in the daytime, with the full yellow colour of the sun and the, the, the tree, a blossom tree bursting out behind him. And he used to go for walks, and they're all Braque's walks that I painted. And people's pictures called Braque's walks. Sometimes he's walking next to a lovely luscious nude and sometimes he's just walking by the seashore. Got him. Good now, stuff. this is a, a painting I don't, it's a bit too pushing the symbols a bit too hard. It's obviously the symbol of the owl, which I like the owl. It's obviously the symbol of the moon. Um, it probably looks better now than it did when it was painted, because now everything's so bland and ordinary and boring that um, people just get tubes of paint out of the art shop, squeeze them straight onto a brush and put them straight on. So it's got this rather flat sort of decorative quality about it. Having made a remark about that it was sort of flat out of the tubish sort of painting, you know, I was thinking, well, it's not as quite as flat as we got used to accepting at the moment. And I do believe that painting should have a field of, or fields of layers of endeavour left on the canvas for you to look at, you know, and discover new things all the time. And I just looked at it and I saw the two little bits of pink leaves in the corner and I realised they were forming a part of the painting for a reason. They just pushed something back, like the moon was pushed back because it was, although bright yellow, but it was still not as good as Matisse, but the way Matisse used to push and pull colours around. And then I looked at the owl's face and I thought, gosh, he's not too badly painting this. 
a lot of layers of paint in his head and just the eyes, there was at least three different tones of yellow in the circle before the black blob of his eyes come on. So there's a lot more, I think, to look at and probably all went downhill after Roth Rothko and some of the Americans and Andy Warhol, of course, who was a printmaker. Um, but painting should have, to me, a field of endeavour in them. Um, and unless they're signs, which a lot of paintings are these days, just signs, there should be something that when you look at it, you find more things all the time. And I think that's probably one of the worst examples of one of my paintings, like that, that I have that in them. But it's not that bad as I thought it was. What have we got for me now? Ah, there's another owl. Well, that's just, I must have been in a, a sort of an owl. I realise that I've got this thing about sort of these claw-like legs coming up out of, out of pictures grabbing things. Um, that one probably to me is a bit too dramatic. I don't really like dramatic paintings, but you know, I suppose in a dramatic way it's a dramatic subject. Um, and it works quite well on that level, but I wouldn't put it into the category of a painting I really felt all that enamoured of. So we'll leave it at that. Um, and look for a numero, whatever it is. There we go. Oh, well, there we are. I mean, just said all that, we're back with lots of bright colour. I think that's bright colour how, uh, handled in a fairly sophisticated way in that um, the colour does move around, it does, things do come forward. It's a very simple painting and I can look out now and see the tree that it was painted on, abstracted from, and that was my beautiful um, pear tree, uh, I think it's Lebanese pear tree or something, which changed his colour from being covered in bright white blossom, absolutely beautiful, with these beautiful spacey-like leaves. And as it goes through it, in the autumn, it turns, all the leaves turn bright red. So it's a movement, again, in lots of other paintings that I've said a few words about earlier on, about the movement of time and the movement of seasons. And when I look at it now, I can see a lot more in it and it's definitely got some depth and overpainting of forms I'd tried before and then reworked. If you'd had Picasso's paintings, no, I'm not saying that's anything to do with Picasso, I don't like Picasso that much, but if, if you'd had all his paintings stopped at a certain time, you probably wouldn't like them because it, it changed them so much for the time they were finished. And there's a beautiful film of him painting on a piece of glass with a big white brush and he starts off doing a couple of nice sort of sexy nudes, you know, a la Picasso. And it ends up as a, then it goes through a still life and it ends up as something, it ends up as a couple of figures bullfighting. So this is the sort of thing that you do go through when you're painting. It's, things change in your life, life changes, you see things in different ways. You look at the painting, you say, oh, I don't like that, I'll change it. I do like that, I'll keep it. And then you try and work the bits you like into a cohesive painting in the end. Good. Hmm. Now, um, yeah, I don't mind that one now. The more I say about it, the more I like. Now, this is a very, um, what I call a fairly pretty painting, but it, it belongs to a very pretty Italian lady. Um, not that this is anything to do, but there is a an attached story to this. Um, it's obviously Botticelli's Three Graces a la Douglas Chambers, with some more ethereal background than the Botticelli uh, allowed. His was much more anchored to a certain place. This is anchored to 
basically springtime rather than anything else. But when I was a national serviceman in Cyprus, I went to a, I had a friend of mine who was the local sergeant and he took me, I said let's go and have a look where um, Aphrodite came out of the water at Cyprus and they built us an amphitheatre for her. So we drove into this amphitheatre and in a British Army um, Land Rover I think it was, I think one window was open, one window was shut, my window was luckily open. <laughs> and uh, it was the time of the Eoka terrorism period, not that there was any huge amount of terrorism around, it was enough. And suddenly a, a rifle shot, I don't know if you heard it after that we saw the manifestation of it, but a bullet went straight through my window, must have gone in front of my eyes and out through sergeant, the sergeant's side window, uh, obviously shattering it off. Uh, he leapt out being a sergeant, he was allowed to go around, everybody had to go around, he could be shot at and everybody, nothing to shoot back with, he whipped out his pistol and went push, 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 all around this vast uh, empath Greek amphitheatre and you could hear it going bangity bangity bang all the way around and then we just got in the car and fled back out of the place. But that's not, the, that's not what that's about, but it's just about that I was connected with it in a strange way. Mm -hmm. It's um, to be a very nice pretty pink painting and I think Botticelli was a very pretty painter but also a brilliant painter. Uh, I might be pretty but I may not be so quite so pretty, unfortunately. <laughs> there we are, that one belongs to the lady at the bottom of the hill here in the old farmhouse. Uh, it's just somebody feeling full of life and rushing out. It, somebody said it looks like a sort of, I mean, oh, this was an ex-hippie ex type colony. And I'm living now in, in some of the old houses built. Well, they weren't built then, they were built after. But um, it's just somebody sort of running against the wind and enjoying being out in the fresh air. So it's a sort of image of, I suppose, freedom and love of nature. Now that's one of my pictures I quite like myself. It was, it was called the Geisha Girls. We had a wonderful lady that the previous picture I gave, um, and she used to get lots of Asian students from, from anywhere from Japan to you know, from China to Taiwan, and they were wonderful looking girls, and they were all very, very Asian, and I hadn't actually had a lot to do with it, you know, a very pretty Asian people before, and so I didn't use the Chinese, I used the Japanese figure, um, and there's a small sort of figure of a more naked lady in the background, so it was... Uh, I forget what I called it, it gave it a rather nice title, but it's a painter I quite liked. Ah, that's Brock. Here we go. This is Brock walking through the willows and discovering one of his muses, a fairly buxom and uh, alluring lady appearing as a sort of vision to him as he walks on his last walks through life. And that's exactly... Uh, what I was trying to portray, that it's not just a sort of a silhouette and a, and a, a sexy looking girl, but it has some, has some um, feeling of movement of him progressing towards something and also progressing away from something. And I thought the, I quite like the willows because I walked through those willows lots and lots of times down in the tree park near here and I thought the leaves pushing through them made a wonderful feeling of pushing through time and pushing through different spaces. This has got a story too. It's, um, I don't know 
quite where the figures or what the figures were um, but I know that the figure is a rip off of one of Edvard Munch's Munch, Munch, paintings of himself in his very last few days of life or very later life and I think he's just looking back out of a supposedly clear blue sky full of, you know, hope that these wonderful nubile ladies that have passed through his life at some time. Not that he was particularly interested in nubile ladies, although he did paint a lot of them in various times of his life. But uh, the thing about Munch was that um, he was always unhappy. In fact, he was unhappy enough to be probably almost insane. But he, I, in my opinion, he, he surpasses people like Picasso, Braque, many of the people we think of being the great 20th century painters. There's two that have passed under the vision of lots and lots of so-called art critics. And they're beginning to people are beginning to, or have been beginning to turn probably over the last five or six years, probably even a little bit longer, and say there were two great painters that we don't really give enough attention to. One was Edvard Munch and the other was Alberto Giacometti, the uh, Swiss-Italian um, sculptor come brilliant draftsman. He did the most wonderful drawings you could ever see. Yes. Well, this, this one belongs to a friend of mine. It's at least a painting that I hope supports some of the ideas of having not just a depth of paint, but a depth of symbolism in that the more you look at it, the more you see there were small incidents going on and hopefully I've brought it together into a fairly coherent painting. To look at it and just say, oh, it's called springtime or something, I don't know what it was called, it may have been called that. But then we have got the, this figure of being totally liberated, we've got the heavy, dark, slightly menacing bird there's also some small minor animals and then a, a tree in full blossom. So we've got a whole gamut of different symbols, a whole gamut of different tonal colours. I can use the word tonal and colour together because there are such things. Um, that actually work together and create A, a pleasant object and B, something in which where, as you look at it you get more from it than you thought at first glance. Um, I remember the friend of mine that owns it used to be look after some fairly frail, not old people but young people that were having problems in their lives. And I remember sitting next to one, and he didn't know I'd painted the picture. And I said, oh, what do you think of that picture? He said, oh, I'm looking at it all the time. I keep coming back and seeing different things in it. So there we are. I believe that it is possible not to look at the Mona Lisa like they do in a huge queue um, and whip past it in sort of your allotted 15 seconds to take your selfie. Uh, there is a lot more to painting than possibly we see on television, hopefully, but probably not. Ah, it's a painting I really like myself, that sort of links up to the one before. It's got that, it's obviously Jesus Christ upside down. Um, it's a, a sort of a cruci crucified figure. It's got the feeling of winter just disappearing 
and early buds of spring coming. It's fairly similar if I look out the window, there was something hanging from the tree, but there's certainly two horses in the paddock and that might be a glamorous version of one. And there's a small little house in the background. So it's got all the elements of competing imagery, old and new, the crucifixion, the fact that it's not the right way up, it's upside down, why is it upside down? The bird of prey, the beautiful horse, why is he so beautiful? Why is it so wonderful to look out from the little house and see all these things going on in your head? That's that one. I like that one. All right, that's just simply one called Blossom. And if it doesn't look like Blossom, it's uh, uh, it's a figure that I used to, most of my life I spent, or not most, I forget my life, I, you know, I was brought up in an area where academic draw, drawing was considered worth doing, which I learned to do quite successfully. Um, that's taken, actually that little figure is taken from, somebody would never find it, it's an obscure not that obscure, but Victorian painter. And instead of doing the thing that Victorian painters did the best, that's render the surface photographically, because they were just only just after photography was, and it's mixed in with somebody like the visions of Braque and the visions of Mat uh, Matisse in the great areas of something can be held by a very simple thing at the same time and I quite like the fact that although there's black at the bottom then black going up and then suddenly although this is a wonderful feeling that blossom has just burst into the painting the sort of suggestion of clouds at the back and like winter retreating into the background and the blue sky coming on behind it. So it's got a lot of my things, a seasonal and a play with space and a play with texture and colour. I do now. Up there. Get my finger on it, shouldn't I? There we go. Oh, that's, uh, that's a nice piece of use of paint. Uh, it's, uh, I did a whole lot of little paintings of moths. The, one of the interesting things about it is that when I was at the local swimming hole, it had been a mine. And in the mine, in the sand at the bottom, but there were all these, I saw these little glittering bits of stuff. I thought, oh God, I've discovered silver or gold or something. And when I picked it up, it was pieces of mica. And I thought, well, they're really bother beautiful. So I used them sticking around various images and then painting into the surface that I've made. It's basically just putting on fairly thick oil paint and then just pressing bits of mica into it and then painting an image over the top of that. And it picks up light in different ways. There's another one. That's actually an ant, and I was just using different things that I see, I've got a whole heap of red ants around there. I was going to kill them off, get rid of Somebody came in and said, oh, are you get, going to get rid of those ants? And then somebody came in with a bit more sense. He said, "The one you won't have any white ants if you've got all those ants around because they love eating white ants. So I've kept my ants and I haven't had any attacks of white ants since then. And that's a similar thing. That's a a, a, a sort of a moth, they're mostly moths in, invented by me, but they are moths. And uh, the thing about moths is they're attracted to the light, and that mica is attractive, attracting them to the light. So that's why it's the major part of the painting. And it does reflect back, if you walk towards a little bit of painting, you can see your own colours sometimes being, it's a bit like a, mirror, a textural mirror, 
with a bit more interest to it than most mirror surfaces. There we are again, that's a... Uh, I like bugs and I like insects and I've used it sporadically there so as the black becomes the dominant thing and the mica doesn't take over as in the previous one because the bug being a bug is more an anchored to something whereas a moth being a moth is more interested in the light than it is into the earth. Oh now this is um, <coughs> A different manifestation of my interest of which I noticed there's this was these were done about six or seven or perhaps slightly longer ago and suddenly everybody's on about bees bees you've got to look at bees I had two exhibitions with bees and in the dearth of anybody well, apart from about one person having any interest in uh, what I call flat easel art anymore. Um, my bees didn't get a mention. They're all probably falling over one another to talk about bees. So I did probably f f six big paintings all about bees and 20 or 30 smaller ones. And they have been exhibited a, at Bustleton, Bunbury and in Perth. Um, but not a mention of bees ever. So when most people look at things, all they look at is what they want to see anyway. I'm talking about the critics. Mm. Oh, it's the same one. And he's uh, yeah. It's the same one, but it's probably different. There we are, the bees again. They're just following the pattern of, you know, using uh, fairly dense painting. Uh, back to Jackson Pollock, it's just painting dribble all over a canvas in a controlled way up to a point and then putting images painted on bits of canvas and cut out and pressed into the wet paint and left to dry in the paint and uh, I quite like that one and there's another one so then I got a bit fancy with some of the bees and uh, started sort of texturing up bits of them and giving them a more obvious bee-like look by making them look like bees more than just shapes. Uh, it's a bit like uh, getting somebody to sort of over-explain everything they're doing, but we live in an environment. I'm afraid in Perth, if you don't punch people in the nose with things, they don't even bother to look. More bees, busy bees. Mm -hmm. Bees, bees on blue, they move around to different areas, they're always busy and always wonderful. And here they come again, that's the bees, but it's, that one's got a queen bee in it. As I say, these were all done before anybody mentioned the word bees, and people were bringing out how to do your own bees at home type kits and all that sort of rubbish. Um, you know, and nobody was looking at bees whatsoever. That's that's one's called the queen bee. The poor queen bees in the middle, surrounded by all the, the worker bees or the drones, and they just lounge around. Uh, uh, the worker bees do all the work. The drones don't do anything but comb their bee-like hair if they've got any. There we are, bees on a more obvious. <laughs> Here comes Van Gogh, and he's, he's not yeah, he's not sunflower. But uh, the one thing about that one is, uh, if you look at the bees carefully, you can see all patterns of probably bits of sky and bits of foliage in the actual body of the bee. So instead of just painting a bee in you know a colour with other colours on him, he's actually absorbing as they do do the reflections of the environment around them. There we are, another one. That's bees on bees on a basically just using colour on bees in, in using you know, some have got bright blue sky blue wings, some of them have got oakery green wings. So they're 
obviously working their way through nature, not just being a piece of pretty painting. The fellow in the middle is the most sort of obvious bee-like character. That's just to remind people that they're looking at bees. And that's probably a more thorough one, it's uh, got a bit more... Well, the thing about that one is it, 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 it's positioning the whole thing so it looks busy, it looks um, accidental, the bees look as though they're just there anyway. Um, and they're all texturing in a slightly different way. They're all obviously the same swarm of bees. But the main thing is that they are, it's the organisation of the bees. And of course the bees are a very organised group of insects. Ah, that's a, that's a, a more decorative one, a much more probably meish type painting of bees and it's actually a, a queen bee on the on the on the hide out from a suitus i don't know uh, with a whole lot of interesting i can't remember what the little things at the bottom are I've just cut up little bits of stuff from paintings and use them as a, a plique design um, to foil the more simple straightforward and the little circles have got, you know, rather nicely detailed little bees in them as well. So there's bees 20, before, 20 or 15 years before anybody was ever talking about bees. But now you turn your TV on, you can enter a bee competition. You can get yourself a free beehive if you win it and things like that. So bees are in and I've finished with them. We are. There's a big, big bee painting. This is um, becoming a bit more graphically bee-like as a painter and not as a bee. Um, so it moves from the one with the very mobile queen to obviously the beehive and I thought it was such a wonderful shape, uh, hexagonal circle. I've been done doing lots of moons and in various phrases of the of their uh, manifestation and I thought well it makes a change to have this wonderful interlocking geometric shape that you can don't have to sort of support it supports itself as it does actually in the beehive so we've got the beehive in the middle with lots of little bees being busy we've got the Queen bee, I think, on the left, and I think the queen bee getting a bit sort of eggy on the right. So it's it's basically about the hive, the queen bee living in the hive and being surrounded by all, all her attendants. And it's a, a, a three pound painting, uh, basically, in reasonably complimentary use of colour. Right, how am I? Uh, here we go. Give me an easy one. Oh, there we are. That's a very cloggy, boggy bee. Um, I suddenly realised that probably I should do a few in honey coloured colours, and I mixed up some nice paint, honey coloured, and instead of actually making the bees anything other than painted canvas. I decided just to cut them out and stick them on as pieces of canvas to show that if I hadn't put the paint on, what's underneath is the bees and the bees would be the canvas. So it's a sort of visual pun in some ways. Uh, that's a really big bee painting. That was the beehive on a reasonably big scale with some small, smallish bees buzzing around all over it in various areas. So that was a more uh, bigger and probably uh, slower to paint painting. And that's my queen bee back again surrounded by all these, uh, her attendants. Really an, 
successful painting in many ways. I think the, the colour really works very well as a painting. I think the whole feeling of agitation and the, it's almost got a buzz in the air, although it's still a, a flat piece of canvas. It has plenty of movement and plenty of interest in surface and even with some of the scale of some of the bees are used to push things backwards and forwards a little. But really quite a nice painting and quite pleased with that one. And I like it. I like the wings. They're really nicely painted wings. And there we go, another bee. That's colourful bees. Uh, these. The thing is, if you get, if you cut up enough paintings, you, you sometimes get a good one coming out of it. That was probably the, the end of cutting up endless, endless paintings and storing up lots and lots of bees and pulling them out. I've still got some, but not bees. I've got some other images that I've cut out of various uh, old paintings or bits of stuff I've come across. But they've all got interest, interesting quality other than just the image of a bee, they've got little bits of other paintings mixed in with them. So they're a bit of a time thing as well. That's a very chunky bee painting. He's very tiny. He's not much bigger than eight inches by six inches or something like that. So he's a very uh, powerful little fellow, colour-wise and texture-wise. Right. Yes, well, that's probably a, a, a more abstracted a bee, a, a bee, and a bigger bee. It's geek, something about scale. I quite like that one. It's got a sort of strange scale about it, and uh, you're not quite sure where you are, whether you should look at the big bee in the background or the small bee in the foreground. Uh, so it's got a bit of intrigue in that way. And that's the tiniest of them all. And a lovely lady bought it and I said, she, I said, why did you buy that one? And she said, because I loved it. And she, I said, well, it was my favourite one in that exhibition. It was quite a few of them were exhibited at the Bunbury Art Gallery at one time. And that was the smallest one of the lot. And probably the, oh, the most pleasant little bee you've ever, ever come across. He's a lovable bee. And I uh, moved on from bees into other insects, um, and I got fed up with, I didn't get fed up with bees either. They were still intriguing, but I was getting sucked into the world of bees too much. And so I started moving on just not in a superficial way, probably. I wasn't really as excited about sort of crickets as I was about bees, but, you know, I used also, I went back using a bit of the mica in the background. And there's probably another micro in the background one. So I think I've still got that one. No, I haven't. No, I did have it. I thought I had it. That's just mica and black paint, really. It's just a very, very simple colour scheme. But reflected. And um, we're back with the bees. There's some bees. He's a nice little bee, that one. He's having a, having a honey time there amongst all the sort of produce of his efforts. Um, and I, I can draw bees just looking you know, like bit realistic bees and I have in uh, lots of other paintings, but I took to just using a cut out bee symbol um, because I can move them around like bees move around and with painting little bees if you've got them in the wrong place you have to scrub them out and put them all in again. So they were a movable feast and I could concentrate then on you know, the bright yellow of the sun against the bright yellow of the bee's body against the rather churned up sort of honey-like luscious background of the paint. Rolling again. Uh, this is um, smaller paintings. These are just small paintings that appeared with that technique of cutting out shapes and pressing them into uh, background colours. Uh, they, they were, the big paintings were quite big and these were quite small. So 
there's not a lot to say about them other than the, the technique and the it's obviously the the smaller planes of the Spitfires and the bigger planes of the German bombers and they're cavorting and attacking one another it, almost in a playful manner there but it was no play playground oh we change now to living here more in the in the bowels of the earth in bailing up um, and I had a whole thing about uh, the rabbits and although he looks like a hare he's, he's, I think of them as rabbits uh, and snakes that came into my painting. I had a big snake under the house which is a, not that one that's that's more of a dugite but there are plenty of snakes around here and since recently in the last year we've now got rabbits everywhere so my paintings are coming alive and they're running around all around me. Yes, well, that, that's um, a, a fairly decorative painting using big blocks of colour. It's quite a small painting. <coughs> it's the figure is what I call my art, my art school symbol in that you know that's sort of the symbol of the the lady posing in sort of Victorian paintings and a lot of my early experience was being taught how to draw and paint not like Victorian but very much by people that had experienced that sort of background themselves and it's just on the background of you know as you can see a pattern of oak leaves I think I'll leave that one. Oh, but that's interesting. It is interesting. This is one of my agony paintings. They come every now and then. And I feel really pissed off with everything. I've, there's a big one in the shed of me, actually, uh, not me, but a figure of me sort of crawling like sort of Job uh, covered in boils and sores. And when you feel really though you want to scream at the moon or scream at the sun, it was a period, I think, but I used to drink too much and uh, get a bit out of control. And that's my attempt at giving the feeling of, you know, desperation about the way things were going. So it's a personal statement. It's a smallish painting too, it's not a big one. don't know where it is anymore. Oh, this is back to my symbols of, um, you know, this particular area we've got a lot of, uh, though he's not a particularly long necked tur turtle, he's a sort of a bit like a long necked tortoise. Um, and they, uh, it's a spring like painting, everything's coming out of, into the sunshine, having been away for the, the winter and having a wonderful gamble around in the red dirt of Australia. Yeah, so that's just a manifestation of <coughs> the technique of cutting out shapes and reassembling them as a, a pattern and a pattern that hopefully is very pleasant to the eye, it is in a way. Um, no great symbolism in there except naked symbolism of birds and wing, wings which mean freedom and a very nice blue background. This one is, I, I really like this one, luckily somebody's got it somewhere um, and it's really, it's funny, it's about around here where there aren't any houses that look like suburban English houses but it's um, a bit like me in the background as a suburban house looking through the wonderful tree outside my window now which is um, a pear tree. Now, what pear was it? Sorry. Uh, you've said what sort of pear tree it was before, so. I think I said Levelese, but I think it's that could be corrected. Um, it's, it, it's it's really like a day. Three little panels, a triptych, uh, and it's just a day where it starts off with an image, you know, 
the little my little rabbits running around. Uh, then there's a, a, an image of rain, dark yes. rain, yeah. which is. Uh, I had a thing about black rain because I thought, well, oh, if you put nice white rain, it doesn't seem to say anything. Whereas black rain can be good or could be bad. It could be a threat or it could be a welcoming thing. And then a small little image of a blossom tree. So it's just like a, a, a sort of diary of a day in paint. And that's the main thing about a lot of my paintings. I used, I used to use lots more paint than I do now. But um, I used to like pushing the paint around quite a bit. Oh, that's uh, well. That's Brock with his bird. Um, now a simple arrangement. My, my, one of my favourite painters, Mr. Brock, who used to go walking a lot in Britain, Brit Brittany in France um, and he was famous for his great big white bird which appeared for quite, quite often on postage stamps in France so I lived in the south of France not near Brittany at all but in, in influenced by the French culture and that's a memory of that, that era and a little homage to one of my favourite painters George Braque who lost fame to people like Picasso and awful painters like Salvador Dali um, when he was probably as invented and as forward looking as Picasso ever was and probably much better or not better but a, a, a much stronger painter than Salvador Dali ever was. Oh, that's uh, boys and girls having fun in the uh, bushes. It's spring. It's uh, you can go and see it. It's in the it's in the uh, one of the collections in Perth. Um, Edith Cowan, I think, collection. Um, it's got a nice use of linear rhythms, superimposing. You're looking through rails and rails of imagery um, and you have to sort them out a bit like a, jig, a, a visual jigsaw puzzle. That's again a, nothing to do with bombs and wars. Uh, it's just my an excess of birds. But I did a lot of, we used to have the black cockatoos and honestly they were almost black in the sky. I don't know where they've gone these days. They must either got killed off or something's happened to them. Uh, I, I have to go and answer it. Yeah, rolling. Did I, did I go through this one okay? Uh, you were just starting on it and then it got interrupted, so... Oh, well, it's, uh, yeah. it's probably... Oh, this is the black cockatoos, which were absolutely a feature of this valley in bailing up, in that every now and then you hear wah, wah, noises and... The sky would almost blacken with the, the um, floods of these black cockatoos that would come swooping in to go for any up to the pine forest to get all the pine nuts. Now they seem to have disappeared. I don't know what's happened. The pine trees are still up there, but I've never seen a cockatoo now for a couple of black cockatoo now for a couple of years, and certainly not great big shoals or uh, you know, shoals birds, um, flights of birds coming over. Um, there was a local pub here which doesn't seem to ever get, get anywhere much at the moment but um, I did say to them once I, they want, so, uh, not that I, I said I'd do it just just for the birds uh, to glorify them that I'd get a whole lot of stencils rather similar to that there of just black cockatoos all over their tin roof. I said it would look much more exciting coming around the corner and see this flood of black cockatoos against your shiny tin roof, but it never, nothing came of it. This mm. was, um, this actually won the, uh, 
Cossack Art Prize with um, judged by Betty Churcher, uh, which was a rather wonderful prize. It, it, it's not so much it was wonderful, but as an event, it was in this great big old rustic sort of building that all the but all the goods were kept in when they came off off, off the boats. Um, and it was really about the worst place to hang painting because it was all sort of rocky, you know, ready rocky sort of surface. Um, but they had a really good turnout. They got really good people to judge it. As I say, Betty was then still, was not, not particularly at WA. She was running the uh, National Gallery in Canberra. Um, and also, there was a, a thing I hadn't seen much before. Lots of the local Aboriginal people put their paintings in, so it was a really lively looking exhibition. It's uh, just a, uh, you know, a black horse is a black horse. There's one in the two in the field just below me now. Um, one's got a big white star on its bum, and now this one is just a. He's got a little fire now looking at it. And I hadn't noticed this before. Inside the horse there's a figure lying down with his head sticking up through the horse. Ah, so it's got a horse and a rider in a way, but it isn't. It was just a black horse. But it's, it's, it must have changed a little bit over the time. I haven't seen it for a long time. It disappeared, somebody, oh, it disappeared down into um, the Albany area, I think. So, it's a, I, I like the painting myself. And the idea of a beautiful animal and he's sort of disabled by not being able to see what he's doing all the time. So that's the story on that one. Now these are figure drawings, basically. The I, I, these are quite free figure drawings, free, not free, um, free. But they're, you know. Also, there are some tighter ones coming up. But I put them in the exhibition in Bustleton, mainly because I said, look, this is supposed to. It, it was a slice of all different things that we've been looking at. It isn't one particular period of me painting a particular thing and doing like when I did the blitz paintings there must have been you know like 10 big ones and about 30 odd smaller ones and hundred and lots and lots of even smaller ones so I, I said well look, I want some drawings put in because basically I'd spent a lot of time teaching drawing and a lot of it was based on figure drawing as the, the tradition of drawing has been uh, and so I wanted to put some in so this, these are some some of them are more lyrically and freely done and some of them are, are more sort of I suppose straightforward drawings of what you see in front of <coughs> now do I need to do that one this is a bit of the a bit of a, a painting that was 30, 30 foot long and is in Edith Cowan somewhere and you can see a lot of the ones we've been talking about in the background so this must have been in, in the Bunbury Art Gallery and it was Catherine Chert was the curator she did a wonderful job I'm not so sure about this big painting probably I thought it was a really good painting but there's three panels and the whole thing is, as I say, 30 foot long. And it actually just really now is tilted on, you know, it doesn't work really well in that tilted position. It's all right when you're in there and you could sort of look at it closely, but it sort of collapses a little bit into the background. So it was, uh, it was uh, done in Albany. I've got a lovely picture of me sitting in front of me in Albany in front of the huge windows of the 
wonderful studio I managed to uh, acquire for very little money as far as rent left, rent was concerned. Uh, so it, it, it's not a really great depiction of it there, I'm afraid, especially when it's photographed. And there he is again. It's, uh, that's only one bit. There was a, that's the middle panel, and there's a right-hand panel and a left-hand panel, both the same size as that, and that's the width almost of the art gallery. So when they had it up in Perth, it took the whole of one wall. That was my retrospective type exhibition. It was called, a, I don't know what it was called, some name other than the retrospective. And that, one of the main galleries, it, it took the whole wall up to put that on, put that on as an exhibit. That was in the WA Art that Gallery. That was in WA Art Gallery, yeah. yeah. And there we go, that's another, all oh, quite lively drawings. Um, this is another drawing, just nothing to do with Aborigines. I, more to do with Mr. Sura, the French painter, who was the pointillist painter. And I was just thinking about him one day and I, I just threw a lot of images together and I thought, well, it needs some, and I used this, the dots to give this feeling of sort of agitation behind the images. And the images are a mixed bag of what I was working with at that time. And you can see bits of them coming and going in other paintings. That's uh, just another little drawing of, a, of an owl. Bird man. That's definitely a more realistic little drawing of a. It's not an owl. It's a, it is an owl. It's an, it's the little owls that used to be nesting down in the opposite the post office in Bailing Up. Uh, not oo books. There's, there's a name for them. They're just very small owls, and they sit there in little lines and don't say very much. Well, they've chopped the trees down and planted something else there, unfortunately. But there we go. I've got him there anyway now. And this is just a, you know, a sort of academic drawing, uh, just showing that I'm, I can do it if I need to, for some reason. Another one. So these are just art school type drawings. That's actually a whole lot of serious ideas of uh, dead birds. I got, when I was in Albany, I, was, I did a whole lot of paintings based on dead foxes. And I used to go and actually sit in, on the side of the road with the cars whizzing past and see these foxes flattened into slightly different shapes. Uh, and they became quite ex interesting. I had a big exhibition, uh, it was in Perth, and this woman, she sort of marched up to me and said, uh, where, where do you get these up strange ideas? That's what Albany's all about. I said, have you driven along the road in the morning and seen all the squash foxes? And she said, I never noticed. And I said, no, you, but I used to have to drive from, uh, nearby Albany, all the way along the highway to into Albany, and by about two hours later, they're all squashed so flat, they just look like the road. I said, that was Albany, that's a, one of their main features, was things being squashed, unfortunately, on the road. That's back to another figure drawing, I think we're gonna get a couple of those now. Slightly more graphic figure drawing, looking more like a figure and less like a drawing. And oh, this is a strange little painting, I quite liked it. It was called The Gardener, I don't know why I called it The Gardener, probably because he's growing bits of wheat out of him all over the place. But uh, you know, if you think about back to the last one of the figure drawing, then Basically, I can draw figures reasonably, you know, straightforward in a straightforward way. This is a, you know, a bit like Picasso. He got fed up being quite good at something and he descended, decided to dissect it and rearrange it and remake it 
in his in his own way, in his own image. So it's a, it's basically a figure that's remade and reconstituted into what I would think is probably more than what it might have been if it had just been a straightforward uh, rendition of a figure. And the fact that he's got you know bits of wheat growing out of him harks back to the uh, the old English. Uh, thing of the uh, the wheat the wheat man uh, um, I can't think of his name now who appeared with uh, basically wheat growing out of him all over the place it was a sort of a harvest festival symbol and I think that's probably where I thought it thought it would come it might have come from but it, it just appeared lots of things appear when you give them the opportunity. That's my, as you can see me shuffling bits and pieces around, that's uh, one of the areas I've now got quite splendid space to work in. Sometimes artists end up, you know, with very little space and very little opportunity. I managed to clear myself a couple of big spaces to work in. This is one of the smaller ones where I do sort of cutting up things and reassembling and rearranging them and getting ideas. I've got a whole new lot of ideas in there. This is probably, you know, five or six years ago in the, I can see there's the, uh, the Ubu man there, the Lobby Lou man, uh, dominating that particular lot. So it must have been about the tires doing the, the bigger painting of him. And that's Catherine, the lady that was the curator for the exhibition in Bunbury. Quite a big exhibition. She made a really good job of it. She even reorganised all my drawings for me. <laughs> Which I didn't realise until she'd left and gone somewhere else. And I went to look for something I found. They all been put in neat little folders. So... That was a marvellous thing to happen because most of my stuff's a bit of a mess in its uh, arrangement. And you can just see that one of the paintings in the background, the, uh, the sort of one I, uh, sort of spirit running through the through the leaves, and the little lady in the in uh, trapped in the blossom tree. So that's interesting. I haven't seen. Catherine, I think, has gone out of the state now. Now, this is much more recent. This is probably me thinning my paint down and using sort of, almost sort of, oriental sort of techniques like you, you get in sort of Japanese and Asian paintings and Japanese scroll, scroll paintings, or even their, you know, printmaking with big flat areas of colour and a sprinkling of movement of imagery and it's the whole thing and the horse is a, 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 a vital virile figure he's running through life he's pursued as by harpies that Goya did a wonderful painting of a man leaning over in desperation on his desk where his head was filled with so many things that he did them as harpies, their winged sort of demonic women um, attacking him from everywhere. And I don't think they were, they were more like sort of witches than uh, pleasant ladies, let's say that. But this is, you know, it's got, it's got the bees symbol. Uh, it's got the progression through life symbol of the of the skulls and the horse madly trying to gallop his way through them, being pursued by uh, things that might sting him or might be nice to him. It's a sort of life a life experience type painting. Could be written down rather than lots of paintings could be written down. Thank goodness they weren't. There's me off 
Oh, I'm doing it. Yeah. Upside down, just like a. Right, we're mm. back to the bees now. That's one of mm. the bigger. As I say, bees are all the flavour of the month now. What, what's the date today? 2019. Um, I probably did that in about oh, at least six six years ago or more. It's pretty sure it's a big one because I did a lot of little ones at the end and not many big ones. That's quite a big one. And I just, the, uh, in the old pop art days, the, the big image which became famous was a target. Everybody was painting targets. I don't think I did one, but it suddenly popped into my head that um, the bees are almost like target. They can go out and they can find their way anywhere. They can, like us, they've got their little uh, installation where they can report back to the nest and say, come on, this is the way, come there, some nice pollen here, you come this way. And they all go there and they swarm around what they've come to look at. In this case, um, I've used the, the little colourful bee in the middle as being one of the, the queen type bees. Uh, this is uh, again you know, it's a fairly simple painting. It's, it's obviously affected by Mr. Henri Matisse. It's, it's not a rip off of Henri Matisse, it's actually been influenced by him, which is quite different. People these days just do bad Picassos, but they don't even say that they've ever, ever looked at Picasso. They probably haven't. Um, so it's just a, a very simple colour organisation of shapes and forms to make a pleasant thing to look at or in many ways a lovely thing to look at. And that's a sort of loosely painted one of... I did a lot of those rather targety bees and in the end I thought made the target into a or they'll bee nest into a bit of a sort of background thing and the bees into more interesting, colourful, lively, sporadic things. Uh, and it, so it works in a different way. It's not quite so formal. It's more informal. The difference between Tashism and minimalism. Tashism being the excess of paint and the excess of vigour like Jackson Pollock, minimalism being the, in the praise of the ordinary and the nothingness of everything. I'm obviously not a minimalist. <laughs> uh, this is another one of the series Whoops. of paintings that I do, mainly smallish paintings. This is sort of mediumly small. Uh, it's got two of my favourite images. With, that have been twisted a little bit. One is Brock, who I said was always went for long, interesting walks and was a great sort of recorder of the changing face of nature. Uh, and he's walking through, and I always think of Brock as going on these walks, not all that previous to his actually, to his death. And I used to call them the last, walks of George Braque and unconsciously or consciously I I started painting a nice golden cornfield and then I put the wheat in as almost like sort of wreaths of black wheat in that they're like a, it's like a memorial wheat field rather than a Van Gogh wheat field full of crisp golden corn. The golden corn's there, it's fading into the background. Brock is coming into the foreground, but his life is fading away. I think we'll just leave that one. It's a rather a nice, it's, well, I can, I can fit it in. It's obviously, you know, as I said, the thing that saved England was the Spitfires. And that is like the Spitfires, and you know, they actually, Later on, after the war, one of the airfields was in Essex, not too far from where we used to live, and all the all the wonderful forest pictures 
came from the background. Uh, but that's just a sort of homage to the make the make them look as good as they looked. There's a few. There's only one. You know, they're all sort of Spitfire shapes. It was just a wonderful aeroplane uh, made out of almost rubbish. <laughs> um, could go faster than anything else and had an awful sort of piece of detail but had sort of better armaments than any of the German planes. So they saved England and that's, that's them going past in their glory days. They used to go out in squadrons, there was squadrons, you know, and every now and then one squadron would just about be wiped out and they'd form what was left into another squadron. It was a terrible time really. To do a more macabre note on that, and that is, as I say, the, the Spitfires in their glory days, but I, I lived for a while in Brighton uh, on the English coast, and it was a place where lots of theatrical people, including um, uh, Laurence Olivier, right. I lived next door to him, believe it or not, at the time, not in the glorious place that he was in, but next door to him. Uh, but he uh, used to go to the local pubs and it, it, it became a sort of place where people, you know, obviously they got good pensions, I hope they did after the war, and they were very uh, honoured as people. And there was a pub I used to go into and I saw on the back shelf all these bits of arms and artificial bits and pieces of, of people's bodies. I said, oh, what's those? He said, we, we, we get all the RAF boys in that were in the, in, in the RAF uh, squadrons and uh, they get really drunk and occasionally they go off leaving their hand, a hand behind. And he said, I, I keep them all, they're coming later on before the next session and, and say, oh, you got my hand, Bill, and they hand your hand over and off they go, they're quite happy. So that was just a, 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 a consequence of glory days turning into not perhaps glory days all the way to the, to the grave. Uh, so we've got to into the bombers again, so that, that's, that's, that's the shape of the German bombers there. They're looking quite nice there, but they never, they were more, more oppressive than that. Mm -hmm. And they've come over, like the black cockatoos came over for me here, come over me here, and the sky will almost go black and we get a couple of thousand tons of bombs dropped on one area per night, you know. Uh, anyway, back to something a little less. That's, that, that's uh, just a, a collage of, like a garden with bees, instead of the bees being solid bees and dominating as solid forms, the bees are all over it, but I used the bits that I cut, cut out from to reassemble them so as you can see actually what the bees are heading for. They're looking all over the garden for all the blossoming bits and all the green bits and all the edible bits or the, uh, the honey, the honey flowery bits. So it's, it's basically a, a, a bee's tea party. There we go, there's another bee, bee, bee. We've got into the bees now. And that's quite a nice bee one. I've still got that one. Um, I quite like it. It's, uh, it's the first time I used some gold leaf on the bees, another thing and what it does, it doesn't do it there, is in a side light, you're looking at it and suddenly a light comes across the painting and all these little bits of gold shimmer rather like bees moving across the painting. So it's, it's got a charming sort of after effect to it as well. So it looks a bit plainish there but it isn't plain in, in its reality. So this, this, is, um, this is a more sort of it's a it's a Brach, Brach's last walks painting. He's Brach was you know all French painters at that time, all the impressionists and post impressionists had all been trained as classical 
or the hangover of the French classical period. So they could all, they'd all studied the new figure, they could all operate as, you know, figurative painters, and it, that's what made them fed up with keep doing the same old thing that so many people had done before them. And this is basically Brock, as it were, walking past his past in the figurative time of the or the classical French painting time into what he did later on, which was with Picasso was the first people to start using and basically inventing cubism where instead of looking all over a painting and making things recede and come forward in some form of reality, you started from the middle of the painting and you painted everything real as it came towards you, in, the, in not in the normal way of pushing everything back. So, it was, it, and he, I think, was more innovative as a Cubist painter than Picasso. Picasso was always, you know, I think he's a wonderful person, a wonderful painter, but he's always a bit on the flash side, whereas Brock was a bit conservative. He never got away from being conservative, really, as a painter. I, I went, I did, I got a, a scholarship, a bit of the Prix de Rome, and I went, not the Prix de Rome, but a, a, quite a big chunk of it. And my wife, who I married after this event, I had a French government scholarship and we went to France. And when we were in France, we went to look up one or two people. I went to look up my favourite painter, every, every youth's favourite painter, Marc Chagall. And he would have been about 80 then, I was only 20. And um, in Vence, I we were staying in Vence, and I went to see the Matisse Chapel in Vence. I used to drag myself around France, Italy and Spain because you could hitchhike in those days without any fear or any problem. And I went to see um, Chagall and I got a fire. My, my Judy spoke perfect Parisian French. She lived in France. She'd been uh, lived in Mauritius and lots of places. Spent French speaking. Um, and we communicated to the lady that came to the door, which turned out to be his second wife, who became his sort of jailer and keeper at the end of his life, it appears. <laughs> and she more or less shooed her off. And I can see it now. As she was shooing herself off, there was a long corridor like the houses you get here, same sort of design. Straight corridors, all the rooms coming off like that. And at the end is the back garden. And I just saw this figure, and it was definitely a Chagall, just move between her and the, and the far door post. And there was my one meeting with Chagall. The same thing happened with, I, I had so much wonderful luck <laughs> or misfortune, as it turned out to be, in trying to contact all these painters. I had the French-speaking speak, girlfriend at the time, and, you know, uh, and I went to, uh, I found out that Braque had a studio in Paris. And I went to see, oh, I'll go, I'll go and find, I'd been to see uh, Rodin's studio, which is absolutely splendid, but that was open to the public. Anyway, going up these stairs, and that was where Mr. Brock, Monsieur Braque's studio was. Uh, and it said vacances on it, which meant he was on, on holiday and all I could do was that there was a window about this big was look through the window and I could see the sides of some of Brock's paintings which weren't turned this side they were turned side on to me so I saw a whole lot of the sides of Brock's paintings never saw the actual <laughs> ones or never met the actual person so it was a bit of a ghost day but uh, it was worth the try they were attracted to pollinate pollinated pollen 
and that is my sort of big blobs of flowery light pollen. There's their trails of them getting there and communicating to one another how to get there, and it's turned into a, a decorative maze, the same as a flower bed. Well, it's a big bee. It's a, a beautiful big bee, and he's getting his belly full of honey. Um, I like him, uh, and he's got these great big, wonderful eyes with multifocal facets to them, and he's got all his mates scaring around the rest of the uh, area, and he's looking for more pollen. He's found a nice juicy bit there, and he's got a lovely pair of wings, and he's got a sting as well. This is... My wife's brother, Rock, is a schizophrenic young man. Um, he does very really wonderful, wonderful primitive paintings, mainly in coloured pencil. Uh, it's probably a bit coloured pencilish, and that's just a portrait I did of him. Uh, you can't really. The two figures behind have a great story in that Rock used to come down here from Perth. And he'd get off at the station in Bunbury and should have get, got onto the bus that came onto bailing up. And one day he missed the bus. He went to the toilet, missed the bus, and didn't know what to do. And the only thing he could remember is that he knew somebody in Bunbury called Mrs. Garvey. Uh, well, Mrs. You, that's Mrs. Garvey in the background there. It's a drawing he did of Mrs. Garvey. Anyway, Mrs. Garvey turned up and got him on the right bus and sent him off to us, which I think was a wonderful way of ending up. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a better, better reproduction. It's a better painting than that reproduction. Yeah, uh, rolling. This is another one that I got interested in using much thinner, flatter paint like the one with the Asian girl in it uh, and mainly because the flatter you paint as Matisse found out in his later life the more you can get from your colour once you get a slight surface whether it's a raised surface so little knobs of paint stick up then as the light hits it it, diff it diffuses most of the colours that you see it, the flatter the cut, the, the paint, the, the truer it's to the colour that you put down. So I was tending to use, it's a, this is, I say is one of a triptych and it was the, it was the, or oh, it was actually a four of them, the four seasons. This was autumn, so obviously I used this rather strange, overweight looking lady, but she's really taken from the Lindorf Venus who was a small, what the first female figure that they, not the first, but I think, let's call it the first, little piece of sculpture they found um, depicting a female person, a female uh, figure, uh, and that sort of shape. So it was obviously big hips and small breasts for in in those days where it's probably changed a bit now it's small hips and big breasts anyway uh, so i use that particular simple form and it was repeated through in many different ways through four paintings this was autumn which was by the color or by the fact that you know you think of autumn and autumn leaves in a sort of corny song like way which is what we all are really I suppose in the end. oh there we are that's 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 summer and he's obviously or oh, she's obviously overcome by heat and by all the all the wonderful fruit of harvest the wheat colour, the feel of blue sky and summer.
So that, that's, that's the central panel, I believe. The other one was on the right, and there should be either, there should be one of spring. So it wasn't, it was a, a triptych. Right, on to, this harks back more, this is, this is the, this is the springtime. We had summer in the wheat field and autumn in the dying leaves. This is, uh, the lady slimmed down considerably. Um, she's walking into the picture rather than coming this way out of the picture. And she's walking through a field of very pretty colours, spring-like. Everything is light, airy, nothing particularly heavy. So this obviously is the spring painting. So we had spring, summer with the wheat field, winter or autumn with the rather dying, rather more droopy sort of feeling. These leaves are all springing up into a, in a spring-like fashion. Bit of a bad pun there, but there we go. Okay, well this uh, is quite a good example of when I had a lot of images and I've been cutting them out and I think, well, I've got these wonderful negative images. So I started using the negative images that, in other words, the piece that the image was cut out of. So this opened up a different thing of putting a different textured background or a different colour and then putting another colour over the top. And instead of it being, you know, all bees that look just like bees, you started seeing through bees and in the one before with the, the bees in, 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 on pollen flowers, you got them actually moving from flower to flower or a suggestion of that with actually a suggestion of the movements between. So this is a more formal one, a bit more of a sort of Andy Warhol meets the uh, beehive. And it had in the middle, and you can't see it on this particular slide, but I'll just describe it. In the middle was a, a star of it where I just found this little image of a Greek painting, one of the black vase paintings, which I liked very much. And there was a man on it with all these, this big beard, with all these little insects. And I, it said that, oh, he's, he's, uh, he had a swarm of bees settling in his beard. And I thought, well, that made a wonderful nest or hive for the bees that I was doing at that moment. And this is just similar to the bee ones we did using the negative image using brighter colour and looking for an exciting arrangement of those elements. This is the, using the uh, a drawn image into a field of fairly s sort of thickly applied under underpainting um, and pressing mica shards into the paint and then dribbling some inky red colour and out of this comes a rather nice crab. I like crabs. They make they are very decorative shapes and I think he's quite a, a decorative crab. He's even got eyes to look at people with which probably crabs don't have. But there we are. Poor rabbit had eyes, and I don't think the rabbit had that eyes with eyelashes either. Mm. Good. I haven't seen him before. Yeah. Ah, that is Pres me there. And that's a big bee painting. I think it's the best one of all the bee paintings that I ever did. It's a bit washed out because of the light hitting it there. But it's really a whole compilation of every, all the bee paintings put into one big statement of what I had been painting and what I ended up with knowing about anything to do with bees and my interpretation. And so it was actually called A Life of Bees. Oh, here we are. This is this is rather 
I, this is on from the Mica paintings. I started getting interested in doing various in, insects. Another one of my favourite painters is a man called Odilain Redon, another French painter, a, a symbolist so-called. Um, and he did this marvellous painting of this big black spider. And I've got lots of spiders in this house. We've got one which we call Wolf, who's a big wolf spider who creeps around occasionally. And that's a sort of homage to Mr. Decorative Wolf. If you look very carefully at any insect, even ones you've just squashed, like a mosquito or a small moth that has flown into your light and died and it is a dead wingspan moth in the morning, even tiny little ones. They are absolutely beautiful to look at. Give them a good look before you put them in the dustpan or in the rubbish bin. And he's, a, he's an on the prowl spider. He's got his eyes obviously hypnotized by something he's after. Could be you, could be anybody else. Could be a, a nice little fly. Possibly was a nice little fly. Yes. Um.